you got John Rambo coming in on this mission to rescue these American POWs who are you know, probably listed as MIA. There's no evidence at all that there were any Americans still held after the war, none. My name is Bill Allison. I'm a professor of history at Georgia Southern University. I've been a battlefield tour guide in Vietnam, and I've written several books on the Vietnam War, including one on My Lai. Today, we'll be looking at some Vietnam War movies and judge how real they are. All that's pretty accurate. The helicopters themselves, or the UH-1 Hueys, as well as uh, the helicopter in the scene, the smaller helicopter, that's a loach. So Vietnam is quite rightly known as the helicopter war. Uh, helicopters were used throughout the entire conflict. That's actually Filipino pilots. Uh, bar they borrowed those helicopters from the Filipino army to use for this scene. Now you might wonder why they're attacking this village. Uh, it's supposedly a VC stronghold. VC, the Viet Cong. Why do they have to get it over this village into the river? Why can't they just go up the coast? If you've not seen the film, there's a river patrol boat. They need to get on the Nung River. The problem there is the tidal flow is not deep enough for the boat to actually get across the sandbars. And that actually is real. That's a problem. <laughs> Playing Valkyries just kind of blew your mind, right? Is that real? Uh, probably less so. In at least one case, I know uh, Winston Groom, a veteran who, who did PSYOPs, he remembered uh, flying around at night playing Vietnamese funeral music to try to freak out the VC. Was it effective? I would think not. And I think part of that is making an assumption about the Vietnamese, that they're not as smart, that they would be fallible to superstition and things like that. Okay, there's napalm at work. Napalm is ubiquitous in the Vietnam War. It's very common. It actually is derived from World War II. Give you a point of comparison, probably about 30,000 tons of napalm was used in Korea. Almost 400,000 tons of napalm was dropped in Vietnam. So it's highly flammable. It's kind of like a gelatinous substance. So if it gets on you and burning, it sticks to you. You know, most people don't survive it. But it's designed to destroy cover, and if enemy are in there, then from, from your perspective of using it, all the better, which is pretty horrific. It's a horrific weapon. I love the smell of napalm in the morning. Napalm does smell. Obviously, with everything that's in it, it's going to have a very gasoline-y, petroleum-like smell, so it has a very distinct odor to it, for sure. Now, there's Robert Duvall as Colonel Kilgore, probably one of the most iconic characters in any Vietnam film. He is based on a guy named, in part, by a guy named John Stockton, who was the commander of the unit that's depicted here, the 9th Cav of the 1st Cavalry Division. As far as it being a piece of film, I'd give it a 10, right? In reality, eh, you know, it's a little ludicrous on a lot of levels, so I'm guessing eh, probably about a five. <laughs> The Pavan, also known as the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, so it's the People's Army of Vietnam. The Pavan getting ready, I think that's pretty accurate. What this scene is depicting is the January 1st, 1968 attack on fire support base BERT, uh, which is near the Cambodian border. It's part of the 25th Infantry Division's area of operations. Oliver Stone, the director of platoon, was in the 25th Infantry Division and was involved in these engagements. So that weapon they put in the, in the, lodged in the tree there, it's in essence a marker for the VC and Pavan guys to know where they're at. So if they have to go back, they'll see that marker in the tree, they'll have a waypoint. This is a, an outer defensive perimeter and they've got trip wires set up for flares to go out and that tells you somebody's out there. Okay, what Charlie Sheen just did there was fire the, the claymores. So you've got these claymore mines wired out along the perimeter. So when the enemy comes through, they're explosive and they shoot out a bunch of shrapnel. It's a clicker. Uh, and so you, you try to 
bang it so that it, it, will, it, will, it will fire. So the bunkers that you see Charlie Sheen in and others, if you had the time to cut down a couple of trees and put some logs on top of you, that's a good defensive position to be in. You had a command bunker, which the guy runs into with a grenade, blows it up, right? I'm like, good luck with that. One, you gotta know where it's at. Two, you gotta be able to see it. It's dark, except for the, the flashing of different explosions and stuff, which means you're gonna have trouble maintaining your night vision. So uh, that probably more likely could have been hit by mortars or you know something like that from the enemy. Dump everything you've got left on my pod. Okay, this is a really desperate act to call everything remaining, every, everything up in the air. The problem with that is you're going to kill a lot of your own guys. And how often that happened in Vietnam? Very rarely. So a fire support base is actually, it's, it's a small post, but it's very well organized, very well defended. What's depicted here is not that. And so uh, the VC are hitting it before it's well defended. And the actual battle, I'm not sure that's actually, you know, that realistic. If you watch the scene in its totality, uh, you know, I'd have to give it a six, maybe. Um, as far as the actual real battle, I think it's a little overplayed. <laughs> Tunnels were kind of the go-to fortification, especially for the Viet Cong. But for the Pavan, that part, I, I don't know, I, I, I could see where they would have entrenched bunkers, probably, but to spend the time to dig an entire complex like was depicted in the scene seems to me a bit of a stretch. VC would do that because the VC usually are locally based, not moving around as much. They have an operating area and they're going out. Pavin, they're, they're moving around. So this is where uh, we're, we're really infatuated with the helicopter as a way to bring lots of troops into an area that otherwise you can't really get to. And the idea is an element of surprise, although a bunch of helicopters coming at you isn't really surprising because you can hear them from a long way off. So this is depicting the November 1965 Battle of the Yadrang Valley. This is really the first time where American forces face off against the People's Army of Vietnam, the Pavan, like, you know, in hand, tete a tete, right? This is part of Americanizing the war. That, you know, the Johnson administration, the Pentagon, MACV, Military Assistance Command Vietnam, determined that the Arvin, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, is not quite ready to fight on its own. This is a Pavan operation. Those were clearly Viet Cong. They had the hat, you know, the, the conical hat, the, the, the black, right? Okay, so the way the Pavin reacts, you know, it, it seems like there's just mass wave assault. And that's actually kind of accurate. The Battle of Dien Bien Phu in 1954 against the French, uh, General Giap, you know, just ordered wave after wave of these costly assaults. I mean, they, they won the battle, they defeated the French, but at great cost, and Jap was criticized for this. But this kind of stays in the doctrine, if you will, uh, for the Pavan, of this is how you do things. And in this scene, part of the tactic is, is to get as close to the Americans or to, the, to your enemy as possible. So if you can get close and hug your enemy as quick as possible, that makes it much more difficult to, to call in the airstrikes. But they're learning. This is early. You got, we're talking 1965 here. So they're, the, I don't think the Pavan is fully appreciative of the capability of American air power, how quickly it can respond. Broken arrow! Broken arrow! At one by zero! Okay, broken arrow. For a lot of us, if we heard Broken Arrow, we would say, well, how more lost a nuclear weapon? What's going on there? Because that's what the code word is for, uh, some incident with a nuclear weapon. Broken Arrow may have been the code word for that particular operation. If they were in danger of being overrun, what happens when you call Broken Arrow, 
all air assets in the area, whatever's up there is supposed to converge on your position and drop on the coordinates that you give. And that's what happens here. Uh, and that's real. But it's not how Moore going broken arrow, broken arrow. According to the book, it was the uh, forward air controller. Minor inaccuracy. But Mel Gibson has to be the hero, right? So there's your napalm. And in one of these attacks, it is true that the napalm was dropped so close to Moore's perimeter that a couple of American soldiers were actually burned in the napalm attack and killed. I know a lot of people who really like this film and, and because it's dramatic and, and if they've read the book especially, but this attack, it just, it, it fails on a lot of levels, I think. I'd give it a five. Look out there, Sergeant. Do we see him? They got rifles. Can you see the rifles? This, this is a bad situation. We've totally lost command and control here. He didn't want them to fire, but someone started firing the lieutenant there. He's clearly lost it because he's seeing things that aren't there. So he's seeing VC running around and he can see their SKSs or AK-47s. Tom Cruise's character is looking and going, I don't really see that. You've got bad leadership at the top, uh, who makes a guy makes a bad assumption. Then you have lack of command and control discipline over your own troops. This is not outside the realm of possibility. We didn't do this, did we? Oh my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. This just shows how things can go wrong and a lot of civilians get hurt and killed. So if this village had been a, a VC stronghold and there had been actual Viet Cong in there, clearly identifiable and everything, yet, no doubt they would have fired into the village and then swept into the village. This is not so much like a search and destroy mission, it's more of a sweep and clear. Search and destroy, which is a pretty common tactic in the, in, for, for the Americans in, in the Vietnam War, is basically go out, try to find the enemy, make contact with the enemy, then call in firepower to, to destroy them, literally kill them. But when you do things like this in the scene and you kill a bunch of innocents, that sets you back a lot with the local population. But there were instances where villages were attacked uh, innocently. So for example, the My Lai Massacre, which occurred in March of 1968, uh, when a company of American troops as part of Task Force Barker went into the Son Mi village complex, and, and specifically My Lai itself, expecting to find an entire battalion of Viet Cong. And they get in there and there's no 48th local force battalion. It's not there. The villagers are there, but they're so amped up that they just, there's some immediately assume that they're all VC. By the end of the day, between Mi Lai and a couple of other places in that area, uh, well over 500 men, women, and children were killed. But Mi Lai is a rarity. It's an exception. I, I'd give it a, an eight. It shows just how a couple of bad decisions or happenstance can, can cause a tragedy. In, 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 in war, and, and unfortunately, war is all about tragedies happening. So the setup here is you got John Rambo coming in on this mission to rescue these American POWs who are you know, probably listed as MIA, the war is over, and, and there's still Americans being held by the nasty Vietnamese, right? There's no evidence at all that there were any Americans still held after the war, none. But after the war, there became a cottage industry in Vietnam and especially in Thailand of selling false information to families who had people listed as missing. And all those missing names are listed in the New York Times. They know who they are. They know the units and everything. They can create fake dog tags and rust them up and everything. And you'll pay you know, $10,000 to somebody in Bangkok who has this information on your loved one, right, in the hope of. Ross Perot got hung up in this, trying to rescue people. Again, Chuck Norris made six films <laughs> about going back and rescuing these people. We get our history from movies, so we all come to believe that this is the case, right? It's a tragic deal all the way, all the way around, I think. 
when this film comes out, you know, height of the Cold War, you got to have the Russians in there, right? Now, would a Russian been out there at this prison? Uh, probably not. Thousands of Russian and Chinese technical advisors, military advisors, were in North Vietnam throughout the whole conflict. A lot of them were there to train, for example, uh, North Vietnamese uh, anti-aircraft crews to, to operate these Soviet and Chinese you know, fairly sophisticated anti-aircraft weapons, but they also have, uh, you know, operational and strategic advisors. So that's not uncommon at all. I, I gotta like a guy who's muscled like that and can operate an M660 with, with impunity and kill pretty much everyone around him. But as far as reality goes, zilch. Gotta give it a zero. Okay, let's set up this scene. This is from the Green Berets. It was filmed in 66, 67, released in June of 1968. So this is after the Tet Offensive, after the New Hampshire primary, after you know Martin Luther King's been assassinated, Johnson's announced he's not gonna run again. This is not the best time to release the Go Ra Vietnam film. This is based on Robin Moore's novel on called The Green Berets. In this particular scene, this Green Beret team is going to kidnap this Pavan colonel or general, but as far as units working together like with the Green Berets, you know, maybe. 1965, 66, 67, there's probably more of the Americans working on their own. There would always be an Arvin liaison with bigger units, like probably at the battalion or you know, regimental level, certainly at the division level. The game must have been engrossing because they don't hear anybody else. You've got six or seven guys coming through with combat gear and combat boots on, on a pier and beam wood floor that apparently doesn't squeak, and they're none the wiser. It's just totally ludicrous. And now we have to do this in dramatic fashion and we have to repel off the second story because apparently the guys playing Mahjong still are not alerted that something's going on. Ah, everything goes according to plan. So the tripwire, uh, is that a common thing for, for special forces to do? I'd say no, because you want to be able to get out of there and get away quickly if you're on some sort of mission anywhere close to like this one. But even then, do you have time to do it? That's more of a thing you set for a defensive position. Can I have a rating of should never have been filmed in the first place? Zero, totally. And I hate to do that, because part of me likes some John Wayne films, but this one, ah, uh, no. This scene is depicting the battle for Hue City, which is part of the Great Tet Offensive in January 1968. What you just saw with the tank going forward, the Marines going behind the tank, yeah, that's good policy. But then you see all the firing, so it's been pre-sighted. But what's funny to me is then the Marines get up and immediately go into that area where they just pre-sighted, pre-ranged, fired. So if I was the bad guy, the enemy, I would have fired again while the Marines were all right there. But they don't do that. Now to be clear, this looks nothing like Way City <laughs> at all. Way City, there's no tall buildings like that. It's, it's very dense buildings. There's not a lot of maneuver room. But here it looks really open. In part, this is because they filmed this outside of London at Becton Gas Works. The one thing they do get right, because it's outside of London, it's overcast. <laughs> So during the battle for Way, it was overcast for most of the time, which made it difficult to get air support in. Now, if you notice at the very beginning there, when the firing starts to come from the building, it's not a single sniper. It's several machine guns set up there. A sniper would have fired a couple of shots and got the heck out of there. These guys are in place, so it's hard for them to move. So that's why the Marines respond, which is blasting the area with fire, trying to hit them. All right, so there he is taking a picture. It was not uncommon for uh, soldiers to have nice cameras. 
because they get R and R sometimes. They can go to Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, I should say now. If they're officers, they can go to uh, Hong Kong or someplace like that. And you could buy really nice cameras for not very much. And this would have been a Pavin sniper. The Pavin snipers are gonna go out to specific targets. VC snipers tended to use the tactic just as, to cause chaos and fear. So you randomly hit somebody. You see a guy on a radio headset talking on the radio, that's probably an officer, you're an easy target. The visual part of it, the, way, the setting of it is to me all wrong. Other than the overcast skies, that is realistic. I don't know, I'd give it probably a six. I don't think he needs binoculars to see that the enemy is approaching, but it's a good touch. The scene is really about the 1972 attack on Quang Tree. So the Pavan have occupied Quang Tree City and the Citadel, and the Arvin are trying to take it back. And the Arvin, of course, they've got all the American stuff. So their uniforms were American styled. That's spot on. So you gotta remember this is 1972 you know, following the Easter Offensive. So by that stage, even though the United States is technically still in the war, we're not doing a lot of combat activity at that point. Most of our troops are out of Vietnam by then. <laughs> Equipment's good, they've got AK-47s. Some RPGs there. So the Pavin unit that's depicted here is, is, a, is a basic infantry unit. Yes, by this time in 72, they've got tanks. They're a conventional force. The only thing they don't really have a lot of is air. Uh, you did see initially uh, the uh, forward artillery guy calling in the artillery strikes, which didn't do anything. But there's no depiction of him you know, asking for an adjustment of fire to hit which I think in reality, there would have been a fire adjustment and they would have kept firing on those APCs until they got really close to the Pavin perimeter there. So that part of it, I think, is, is not accurate. I like this movie. Uh, it's, its production value is not great, um, but the storyline and the, the period it's set in and, and the way they depict soldiers and everything, I like it, and this battle scene even though the Arvin guys are out there exposed and whatnot, I gotta give it a six or seven, actually. I kinda like this one. So I have two favorite Vietnam films. One is from the early 70s called Go Tell the Spartans. And it's early in the war, it's in the advisory phase. And it's kinda foreshadowing the problems that are going to arise. The other one I like a lot is actually Good Morning Vietnam. Hey, thanks so much for watching. I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to watch some more, click on the next video.